Hmm. Um, hmm. Lucas, you sure it's all right at your end? Have we got microphone on and things? I can mute you, but I don't want to. Edit mic settings. You don't have a mic volume, which suggests maybe you're not on. So I don't know what to do about that. Ben Ritchie has a question already. Let's see who else is here. Ben came in early. Can you hear me now? So if I look here, I'm still learning this thing. So I think I can see who's here. I've got five people. Good. All right. So we're getting ready for uh, uh, live stream, live office hours to get going. Lukash is still trying to work out his uh, uh, his microphone. Lukash, I'd help you, but I'm, I'm not sure how. Oh, I know how. I bet people are hearing you and I'm not. Helps if you plug into the correct uh, plug. That would be the source of the problem. Uh, yes, this is a technology uh, live stream. Uh, we're supposed to be technology experts here and uh, plugged into the wrong thing. Try it again, Lukash. All right. Can you hear me now? There you go. You're uh, quiet, but I can hear you. That might be my end. Quiet. There we go. Hurrah. Okay. Sorry for the obligatory challenges getting on. I'm Squirrel. Uh, welcome to my office hour. Uh, we're going to talk as long as it takes to, to answer all your questions. Um, we've got uh, several people on, which is great. And we've got Lucas. Lucas, you want to give a, a brief intro, who you are, how, why you're in my community, why, why you're here sure. today? Sure. So in previous life, I was uh, a software engineer for around 10 years or something like that. And around five years ago, I co-founded a startup then called NomNom. At some point, we pivoted to call it EnjoyHQ. And what we do is a UX research repository, which says very little to, to people outside of the industry, which I can go into in more detail. And I was the CTO of it until uh, last April when we got acquired by userzoom.com. Uh, great partnership because they are also in the same space of uh, uh, selling to designers, UX practitioners, and researchers. So that's a great, great complementary sale. So yes, uh, we were. There's a lot of details that I skipped over, obviously. That's fine. But the most that's important great. one is that I met Squirrel while I used to work at Gecko Board, kind of, because I think you got engaged with them after I left, but I kept in touch with everybody, including Paul, the founder. Yeah. And then and we had in touch and said, you should talk to the squirrel guy. And I remember, what exactly. nom nom, I don't know what they do. <laughs> exactly. But we also, uh, Square was instrumental in, in transforming how I was uh, running my team while, while being the CTO of, of Enjoy HQ. And um, yeah, we've been in contact ever since. Wow, fantastic. You can say nice things about me all day if you want. That would be fine. But this isn't the yeah. nice things about Squirrel Stream. This is the answer and <laughs> question stream. So, Lukash, I hope you have lots of great questions for me. For anybody who doesn't know me, I'm a consultant. I work with loads of different companies, about 150 in the last uh, six years, one of them being Nom Nom, where I worked with Lukash. And uh, lots of you who are here um, uh, have questions for me as a result of working with me or uh, knowing me through that kind of uh, activity. Uh, I wrote a book called Agile Conversations, so I'm not trying to sell it to you. I'll send you a free copy if you ask me. Uh, very happy to uh, share it uh, all about how to talk to your tech team. So that's one of my favorite topics. So I'm ready for questions. We already have one queued up. Lukash, I'm hoping you have some. When yeah. we run out of questions, we'll stop. So, um, <laughs> or, or when I'm tired or uh, I'm not having fun. Those are the criteria, fun, uh, tired, and uh, lots of questions. So if we can get all that together, we'll be doing well. Fantastic. So Ben Ritchie, uh, who I know as a, a very successful CTO, uh, very pleased to have him in the, in the, in the, uh, in the stream. He asks, uh, now, if I'm really clever, I can make this show up on the screen. Let's see if I do that. Whoa, look at that, all this technology. Well, I'm gonna read it out too. What is your opinion on the politics of shared service teams versus shared ownership of a technology base across product squads? Okay, my head already hurts, um, so I'll try to figure out what all that means. But there's a translation, excellent. I.e., is Conway's law desirable or regrettable, but something to delay if possible? Okay, so let's, let's try to break that down a little bit, because that is way too complicated uh, to deal with all in, in one go. But thank you, it's a fantastic question. So uh, the, the question is uh, uh, about... Uh, 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 how do you handle Conway's law, which says that um, your organization is going to be reflected in your uh, code organization? Uh, and if you're going to have a service over here, then you're going to have a team that does that service. That's that's the theory of Conway's law. Um, I'm not sure who Conway was. Maybe somebody can tell me. Um, so, uh, and what's my opinion on the politics of shared service teams versus shared ownership of a technology base against? Ah, I get it. Okay. 
So I, I'm not sure exactly what a shared service team is. Um, ben uses it with capital letters, which is kind of scary. So that kind of suggests that I'm supposed to know something that I maybe I don't. So apologies if I don't. But um, if this means uh, you've got product squads, so groups of technology, groups of engineers who um, have shared ownership of the code that they all work on together, then that's one that I'm a fan of. So <laughs> that I work very well. Oh, and the dog is happy. Is that Mr. White? Uh, so uh, excellent. Um, uh, big, big mascot, fantastic dog. You'll hear uh, my wife's guide dog bark as well. Uh, so um, uh, if the squads are all working on different um, components, um, but then they share all of the code and I can commit to Lukash's component, Lukash can commit to mine, and we can both commit to Ben's and so on. There might be ones we work on more, but we can all work on the same code base. That usually works very, very well. What doesn't tend to work very well, and I'm not sure what shared service means, so maybe Ben should you know, help us out here and, and clarify. But um, uh, if, if the notion is um, there's my code and you don't touch my code and I don't touch your code, and if we need to do anything to my code and I'm on holiday, well, then we wait till I'm back. That causes a lot of problems. So I'm not a big fan of that kind of uh, separation of ownership into my code and your code. Uh, um, so uh, maybe it's the um, uh, Arlo Guthrie, uh, um, is it Arlo Guthrie? Woody Guthrie uh, ver um, uh, version. Um, th this code is my code, this code is your code. Uh, that, that's my philosophy. So uh, Ben is uh, um, commenting here, uh, shared service is a sub team that own a technology and have their own priorities versus a shared tech that the squad share and update. Yeah, when, when I talk about uh, technology ownership, I start to get very nervous. My, my spidey senses start to tingle. Um, it's great business for me. So if you have a team who's doing this, maybe you need some help. <laughs> so come and talk to me. I'm not trying to sell you. All I'm trying to point out is that um, it it's, tends not to be a very good uh, way of organizing your team to have handoffs between groups. And when you start to talk about ownership, then you start to, to get the feeling there's territory there that I'm not supposed to touch. So I hope that's a helpful answer to Ben's question. Please uh, ask more if you'd like to. I um, actually I actually would yeah. like to follow up on that. This Please. is something that, that's what you're that here for. I'm learning about post acquisition, uh, which bet. is um, you know, user zones, product and engineering organizations, like over 100 people. Plus they added our small team. And as you can imagine, our dynamics were completely different since everybody has to do everything. Uh, we have a lot of shared responsibilities and as we are learning uh, that things are quite not the same in a large organization. So for example, uh, like there's there's so-called platform team that own all the infrastructure and so on. It's something that's quite um, incompatible with how we did things because we, we run stuff ourselves. So it's quite And how big are the teams? So how big, Lukas, how big was your team at the at the peak and how big uh, is the users? Yeah, so it's, it's five the size engineers. Matters. Yeah, it's five engineers, uh, including myself, uh, doing basically everything. I'm the, I'm the informal infrastructure team, but of course, everybody contributed to it uh, pretty much equally. Uh, it's yeah. more about the and ownership. How about, and user Zoom as a, how about user Zoom as a whole? How many engineers there? Uh, that's, that keeps changing, but it's around 100. I'm not yet clear about how they're divided, uh, yep. but I know that there's a platform team and it is a shared So resource. Conway's law is inescapable yeah. there. Uh, you can't avoid, I think, at 100 engineers having some uh, substructure which is going to be reflected in your, uh, in your code. I don't know of 100 person teams. If anybody here has, tell us, I'd love to hear about it. 100 person teams that have no substructure at all, have no code ownership, have no division. But I certainly know five person teams who do. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I wanted to ask, like, what is your experience? How to navigate that? Because I do see there has to be some ownership, collective ownership of the platform. It cannot be free for all. But at the same time, uh, not necessarily at user zone. But I'm definitely aware of, of other companies that I will not name where something as simple as like rolling out infrastructure changes is opening a ticket in Jira and then waiting for it to be closed eventually. Yeah. Uh, when somebody in remote stand feels like doing it. Yeah, that's very exactly. Common. Exactly. So, so you know, that's obviously the extreme. At the same time, coming from a background of like completely buying into you build it, you run it uh, perspective, like how you seen what is the best middle ground, if there is even a middle ground. But yep. You course. buy it, you run it as long as is humanly possible. Uh, you, you build it, you run it. That that's my philosophy for for just as long as you can make it, um, because uh, uh, and often a little bit further than you actually can make it. Uh, because you, the, the real reason to make any organizational change is because you're feeling pain. Uh, 
Um, if you can make it with an organization that has is completely flat, has no code ownership, um, and it's a, a, a thousand people, I think that would be great. Please tell me how to do it because I'd love to learn. Uh, I can't see a reason why you would make a an organizational change like introducing this shared service idea, which I didn't know, um, unless you were feeling some pain that it would solve. And at some point you would, right? When sometime between Lucas's five and user Zoom's 100, they hit a point where um, it, it was just organizationally too complicated to keep the code uh, all uh, unified and have ownership of all code by everyone the whole way through. There are organizations that make a huge investment in doing something pretty close to that. Um, if I remember right, is it Google, I think, who has a single repository for everything um, and, and has a lot of pain as, as a well. result? <laughs> Yep. So <laughs> physical management of that many lines of code is challenging, uh, but they get a lot of benefits from uh, any Googler being able to go into any part of the code. Okay. So I hope that was helpful to Ben. Um, uh, fire on uh, more questions, Ben, if you have them. And everybody else, we've got uh, a nice little crew here of, uh, of folks uh, available. Um, Lucas, you're, you're here to ask some questions, I hope. I told you to bring your hardest ones. So <laughs> yeah. uh, send one my way, and then everybody else, um, put it in the chat if you have a question. Uh, and these, yeah. this is this is wide open. Future events are going to be uh, more focused on particular topics. This one, you can ask me my favorite football team. Um, I, that'll be a really hard one. Go ahead, Lucas. Uh, yeah, my, my question is, well, understandably, we will be quite often related to, to, to transitioning from being a tidy team to, to being acquired and so on. So one thing that's that what I acquisition is, is. It's, exactly. it's, it's a sudden di jump in the, in the deep end. By the way, I see a, a great question from Eliza, which we're coming to next. So hang oh, on, yeah. Eliza. We'll do Lucas's question first. Go. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I found it quite interesting uh, how I underestimated how hard it is to align people in, in such a huge team and it's hard to worst. find them. <laughs> exactly. Forget aligning them, like figuring out where they are. Is exactly. Different. That's one. But then also managing the team through the transition of like, okay, we are no, you know, we are no longer a, a squad of like six people doing everything to, to kind of incorporate them in a larger ecosystem and, and spreading the, the change in the information, managing that. I found that it's quite stressful for everybody involved because there's a lot of unknowns and, and, you know, I'm still finding my way through it because it's like mm -hmm. a layered cake of like, I'm not sure how things are set up. My team is even more disconnected from it. So I'm trying and, to- And I bet them. lots of them don't know either. What's the question? <laughs> so the question is like, what are the strategies for like smoothing that out if possible? Or what have you seen that works or doesn't work what to avoid in those kind of situations? Because it's inevitable that at the first problem that comes to mind that you start worrying about in this situation, like, are people going to leave? right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just a lot of stress, a lot of change. So you're jumping around a little bit. Sorry, yeah. Lucas, I'm, I'm losing you. So is, is the question yeah. about retaining people post acquisition or is the question about aligning with the larger organization? Okay, it's kind of both, kind of both. How to manage pick one, the organization. Pick one. Pick and one. out of that is like, you know, any other strategies for, for making sure that, that people just don't leave in frustration because I kind of feel those kind of intertwined quite a lot. Okay. So you're looking for alignment for your team post acquisition and the the goal of the alignment is to keep people from leaving. Okay. So um, I'll answer mostly about how to align in a large organization in a complex one where you don't know what's going on or where to find people. Um, and, and my favorite way to do that is kind of an agglomerate, agglomerative technique. We've got Eliza here who's from biotech. So um, I'll use kind of a biological analogy. Um, when, when you've got, um, uh, you know, you've probably seen algae that cover most of a lake, right? They, they're kind of cover the top of it. Um, and, and the way they get to cover a lot of the lake is each individual al algum, I don't know how you say that, the individual al al algae unit um, grows and it divides. It's not like there's some massive plan from, from this algus over here to that one on the other side of the lake. Hey, let's take over the lake. There's, they're just each doing their own thing and they grow locally. So that's the method that I would suggest you use for um, uh, finding alignment in the larger organization. Don't worry about the whole organization. There's people in faraway places. There's people in other departments and so on. You'll get to know them. But I'd say on day one, post acquisition, there's going to be some people who are in the near the near neighborhood, and, and you want to make sure that you're you're very closely aligned with what they're doing. Now they may be way off from the rest of the organization. You know, we're on a little side part of the lake. We're on a, a little backwater. You'll find that out. Uh, but uh, if you can get closely aligned to the small group that's near you, whatever group you've been assigned to, or however you're you're working with them, uh, then that's going to be useful. And how do you do that? 
that's not that different from how you aligned with your small team previously. It, it's going to mean a lot of conversations, a lot of discussion about where you're going, a lot of um, uh, uh, questions and creating conflict and um, uh, wondering where they're having conflict and what challenges they're having and aligning the team, which, which used to have one kind of problem. How do we get acquired? How do we get big enough to matter? To suddenly not really knowing what their problem is. So they need a shared problem. So um, to, to summarize all that, um, be an algus, be a, an algae, however you say that. Um, if somebody knows, tell me, because now I'm curious, what's the singular of algae? Um, be, be one and, and grow locally. Look for problems and align your team to those problems. Because uh, as my co-author Jeffrey likes to say, um, a, a team is a group with a shared problem. And your team just lost their problem because their problem used to be grow. They may have the same problem, but with a very different focus inside the larger organization. Is that help, Lukash? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's it's quite interesting. Like implicitly, that's that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, because the problem has changed. Like now, how can we hire as fast as possible? For example, that's an interesting problem that we never had before because we never had to hire. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Like making that explicit uh, feels feels like the right right way to go because it's also like a shared story that you can tell everybody else, like, okay. Indeed. And then when you get to be kind of a larger mm -hmm. organism, Eliza's pointing out the singular of algae is organism. I have to go look that up. Uh, now I'm really confused. But if you're one larger organism, you've taken over part of the lake, then you can find out that actually you're in the wrong lake, but you know, you're, you're far, and then you can start to, to uh, align with the larger organization, but focus yeah. locally first, uh, yeah, break it absolutely. down into smaller pieces. Cool. I'm going to go on to Eliza's question. We have a comment from Ben, which I'll just mention here. Uh, I think I can show it. So uh, there's Ben's comment. Um, uh, I agree on delaying for as long as possible. If everyone owns a shared tech, no one owns it. But when you create a shared service team, you end up with politics and teams fighting for priority. And I agree with that, except there's an even worse problem, which is you wind up with handoffs. So you might be able to solve the politics and teams fighting. But when you wind up with, I need to wait for the back end team to do their piece so that I can build my business logic so we can build the front, you, you know, you're done in 2027. Um, and uh, that's death, no matter how big or small you are. So uh, that's my view on that one. And then we have a wonderful question from Eliza, uh, whose question is definitely not too banal or specific. No, uh, no doing yourself down there, Eliza. Great question. Uh, can you please talk about the right kind of CTO in a deep tech business with a wide range of technical skills, not just software? That is fantastic. Um, so uh, I've been hiring a lot of CTOs recently at uh, all different kinds of companies. And um, pretty much everyone at the CTO level has very significant non-software components. So I'll just pick one and I'll just, uh, obscure them a little bit. I think some of them might be here, so they're welcome to say hi if they recognize themselves. Um, but uh, there's a, a business that involves um, movement of objects. So they're, they're moving stuff around. They have to get the right stuff to the right place. You know this kind of business, but I'm not saying exactly what they're moving to give them some privacy. Um, but uh, there's a huge operational component there. Um, there, there's a huge um, uh, component of, of, you know, there's physical laws about how, much, how many things you can fit in a warehouse and how many um, uh, can be delivered by how many people. And there's traveling salesman problems of, of getting the stuff from point A to point B and then to point C and point Q. Um, so there's all these very interesting uh, puzzles which have nothing to do with software per se. They have to do with uh, um, people and, and their um, uh, laws about who can uh, drive what to where and, and um, so the regulatory issues, there's all kinds of fascinating puzzles. And, and um, that's not a terribly, it's not deep tech. I don't think we would, we would give it that title in, in investment terms, but it's got a huge amount of non-software components. Um, so uh, th there exist um, uh, uh, businesses and therefore their CTOs who are uh, only focused on uh, pure software. And it's almost uh, um, an academic endeavor when, when somebody's doing that. You're, you're kind of divorced from the real world. Um, the ones that are closest to that, so I'm answering the opposite of your question, Eliza, then I'm going to get to the actual answer. Um, the businesses that are like that, uh, are often servicing engineers. Um, they're pr providing tools for software um, companies. So, so GitHub might be one example of a company like that where it's pretty much pure software. You're moving bits around. Uh, they're delivering a lot of stuff, just like the company that I was describing that, that moves physical objects. But um, you're delivering bits. You're not delivering physical stuff. And, and so there's um, almost no technical non-software technical skills needed. You might need a bit to do with payments because you got to collect money from people somehow. Um, you might have uh, something to do with finance, but pretty much you can sit in front of your computer, make a lot of bits, move them around to the right place, get people to pay you for them, and go to the beach. 
but those businesses are rare. There aren't many of those. So the vast majority of businesses that I work with anyway, that I see um, are um, ones that have a, a wide range of technical skills, a wide range of different things that you have to inter interact with at the sea level. Individual engineers um, at a company like my example company here might not think about the actual movement of objects at all. They might think about um, uh, how to configure them or how to deploy new pieces of software or something like that. They might be pure software contributors. But any successful CTO at that business or any of the other several CTOs that I'm helping people to hire right now, those folks uh, have these, uh, this, they have to have this wide range of technical skills. Um, and, and Lukas, I'll, I'll point at you as an example. So um, Nom Nom, you were, you were dealing with users and their behavior. And so there's an awful lot of, you asked me a lot of questions about databases, but um, the, you also asked me a lot of questions about how to understand customers, um, what the um, uh, their needs of those customers were, how the, um, the software fit into their workflow. Um, you had a lot of technical skills, a wide range of technical skills, which didn't have to do with um, writing great software or writing the right SQL query. Is that right? Or am I missing something? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, I was actually follow going to, to kind of add on top of what you were saying is that mm -hmm. what I found in my own experience is, is looking at the journey of how Nom Nom uh, Enjoy HQ started and what it actually ended up being is that I had to learn very, very fast to kind of let go of being just purely technical founder and, and actually understand the market as we are evolving our, our value proposition, to use that term. And, and understand what our customers do, what they want, who they are, so that the technical skills can kind of complement that. I almost flipped it. Mm -hmm. I, I remember those conversations that we had where, where it's almost like uh, all the technical discussions just kind of faded away and, and we always looked it back to, to the customers. And I actually brought it home, sorry, as in I brought it back to the team where we, all the conversations that we have until now are all about like, are we solving the right problem? What is the problem the customers have? Is this the best solution? Does it make sense for them? And, and that the required you to understand marketing really well 100%. and the kind of user research that those people did. Now that's completely different from Eliza's research, which is all about how to get the right chemical into the right state so that it will attach to the right um, um, bead. I think you work with Eliza, if I remember correctly. So, so all the DNA in the right place, very different sort of process but equally non-software, mm -hmm. right? Correct. So, Correct. Um, uh, so I'm, I guess I'm coming around to Eliza's question, the kind of person that you want at a C level, and you asked about a CTO, different kinds of people might be VP engineering, head of engineering, um, engineering manager, those people might be some more software focused, but the CTO should not be far off from your chief science officer. Might even be the same person, depending on how you structure it. But um, just like your chief science officer is not going to be um, uh, focused only on uh, DNA processes or chemical processes or um, uh, some other or, uh, working with pharmaceutical companies, that person's going to be more of a generalist. Your CTO should be the same, should be able to get into your wet lab and um, understand what people are doing. They're maybe not going to be running the assays, but can understand or learn very quickly what those people do in the, as, as, just as much as understand your data pipelines and um, how you're moving the, the, the data from the lab into um, an analysis tool. So I hope that was helpful, Eliza. My answer really is um, you need kind of uh, what most CTOs are. It's not gonna be that much different. You may yeah. need some very specific industry knowledge that would help you. It's, it's actually a winning combination if you can have what they call a T-shaped person, which is like someone has very deep knowledge, but then the other skills are good enough so they can orchestrate other people to get the job done. And it's very yeah. hard if you're coming from, let's say, a purely software engineering background. You just don't have those skills. You can only code. And, and that's, that's sadly not enough to, to be at that level. That makes sense. Okay. So uh, fantastic question, Eliza. Come back. If that wasn't um, sufficient, that didn't answer your question, we'd love to hear more or ask a different one. And uh, uh, remaining folks who are here haven't heard from you yet. So uh, Ben and Eliza have asked a question. This is all about questions. We run out of questions. Broadcast is over. So uh, uh, keep me going. Uh, but I know Lukash had one before, and I, I kind of glanced, glanced over it. So you're welcome to go back to that one, Lukash, if you want. Or if you have a different question, fire away. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know that you meet so many people all the time. Uh, have you, what would be like the most interesting 
case that you had recently that you had to like rescue a team, what mistakes they made, or is it always the same stuff that people get wrong <laughs> that you help with? Do they always get the same stuff wrong? That's fascinating. Let me see what's what's the um, what's an interesting mistake I've had to rescue people from recently. Um, and I'm thinking back through different clients and who got really stuck in an interesting way. Uh, well, there's one that's that's relevant to you, um, where um, and uh, again, I'm going to give some some cover to this client. They're welcome to name themselves if they feel like it, if they're here. Um, but uh, a, a company that um, really forgot to talk to its users. So uh, I actually used NomNom as an example with them. I said, um, you know, there are people out there who who um, build their businesses on understanding what customers want. And um, you've done the opposite. You've made sure that there's absolutely no way for you to understand what your customers want because your engineers have never talked to any of your customers ever. And I and I asked them and, and they, they said over and over again, yeah, we get um, these requirements and they're very well worked out and we really think about them and we understand them in great detail. We spend months and months and months building them. And then it seems that customers don't buy them. I said, there might be a connection between these two facts. <laughs> You're building things that nobody wants and your engineers have never uh, talked to the, the people who are actually doing the work. Um, and I have a brilliant um, illustration of this, by the way. Uh, by the way, we also, I see a great question here from uh, uh, my friends at News Now. So uh, I'm gonna get to that question that might be Struan or, or someone else. So glad to have you here. Um, I haven't missed your question going to come to it, but first I'm going to show you um, my favorite Christmas present. So this was actually a Christmas present for my wife. Lukas, uh, maybe you saw this on my Twitter feed. Um, so uh, I'll let people look at it. Um, this is a Rubik's Cube, as you can see. Um, and as I mentioned previously, I've got my wife's guide dog somewhere in here. She'll, she'll come along and bark at some point. Um, and my wife is blind. And uh, so she ordered herself, it was her own Christmas present to herself because she wanted to do puzzles just like I do. And she said, great, here's a Braille Rubik's Cube. Isn't this great for me? And uh, if you're looking at it carefully, you'll notice, and I'm holding it just so you can see the edge very carefully, um, and also run my finger along. Uh, so I'll run my finger along the edge that you can see there, and you might notice something particular about this Rubik's cube, which is Lukas. Do you want to fill them in? What's what's wrong with this Rubik's cube, and why it's did my wife give it to me? It's completely flat, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So my wife unwrapped it on Christmas Day, and she starts feeling it, and she says, "This is a Rubik's cube, but what's wrong with it? I thought it was supposed to have Braille on it. I said it has Braille." And then she handed it to me, and then I understood what was wrong with it. So you can imagine that whoever made this um, uh, had, had very careful designs. I mean, it's very carefully um, um, built, and, and the, it really moves nicely. You know, it's, it's quite a nice Rubik's Cube, and, and all the characteristics are good. Uh, it's got high contrast, so it's easy. If you have a little bit of vision, you can see, you know, there's lots of good things about this, and it was clearly carefully designed, but not with any actual blind people. Because if actual blind people had ever picked this up any time between when somebody dreamed it up and somebody dropped it off at, at our front door, then somebody would have said, this is hopeless, right? This is a completely useless thing, and it has absolutely no value. Of course, it has tremendous value to me because I can use it as a brilliant example of um, how uh, not <laughs> to not talk to your customers. So um, th this particular company, uh, of course, what we did is we got them talking to their customers all the time. And we got a very rapid cadence of um, uh, interaction with customers. And guess what? Customers liked what they built and bought more of it. So uh, that uh, was, uh, in, in some sense, obvious once you did the analysis. But it was um, painful to, um, uh, uh, to to explain and to understand and for them to get it because it, it just didn't seem obvious to them. Mm. Uh, and and they, they hadn't made any Braille Rubik's Cubes like this. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this kind of is a, a wake-up call. They didn't have a wake-up call like that. They just knew yeah. that they weren't um, successful. And once I was able to get hold of that, then we were able to make the tech team just uh, so much more profitable for the company. It's surprising. It's surprising because of that's the business that we are in. We help people to get closer to customers by unifying all these conversation um, channels and, and so on. And, and we found that people just just... It's it's like uh, waking up from a dream because a team, for you example, fool is only yourself running... so much. Everybody's yeah. going to want this. It's so obvious. It's so clear. Yeah, exactly. I've seen. So I guess you asked me for for what was the rarest or the most unusual. I have seen this before, so it's not like it was um, completely mm. new. It was just so stark. Um, but not right. quite as stark as the Braille Rubik's Cube, but pr pretty stark. It so, is pretty uh, incredible. There, there, there's a good story for you. Um, now, let's see. So we have a few more comments here. These are very helpful. Thank you, everybody. So Eliza says, thanks. And she might have got the algae thing wrong. OK, fine. Uh, uh, this, this isn't Squirrel's uh, biology office hours. So uh, if you're looking for biology advice, you know, you're taking your A-levels. Don't listen to me. Um, News Now asks, 
uh, and I think I can show it here. Uh, team extension resource augmentation via contractors hired in from overseas. Have you seen this work? Uh, and then I think we have made a follow up. Uh, team, re oh, this is the same, same similar question. Um, joining ex an existing core fully remote team. Uh, have you seen this work? So I hope this is the, the same sort of question. I'm going to take the longer one here because I think it has a little more context. Um, so absolutely, I've seen this work tremendously well. Um, I will tell you one that's very surprising, and it's actually a good reminder to me after the stream, I have to go check with them. Um, one of my um, greatest successes, I'll also tell you about a failure, and I'll, I'll try to illustrate what the difference was between the two. Um, one of the greatest successes I, I've seen is a company that um, kept its, you know, kind of got started with some remote folks um, and uh, kept those all the way through and hired some really successful, really sharp people in the in the faraway countries, visited them frequently when it was physically possible due to uh, COVID and other things, and um, uh, really kept those folks working well together in two different locations. And the two different locations are very interesting, especially given current events. One of them is Kiev in the Ukraine, and the other is St. Petersburg in Russia. So uh, this company managed to get um, these people in these two different locations. And I talked to them about it. They said, you know, we just don't worry about the politics. We're just working together on the code and um, managed to keep uh, these folks working very far from the London office um, uh, functioning well. Now, I came in to help them with some particular challenges um, about leadership and uh, communication um, the, the, between the, the folks who are leading those, those, all those groups uh, and to help them be more effective. And, and uh, they did a great job and, and are, are doing better now. Um, but uh, uh, so they had, it's not that they were without difficulty. But they've built a very successful business. Um, they uh, release frequently to their customers. Their customers are very happy. They're growing and, and expanding. And so um, uh, that's a, a success story um, uh, 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 of this kind of um, outsourced uh, development uh, going on for a long time. So they, they started early in their development. They still have it. And that's, that's where their technology team is. Um, I will tell you my worst failure story, and um, these folks might also be, <laughs> if anybody's here wants to uh, uh, stick their head up, say so, but I'm, I'm, I'm making sure I'm, I'm uh, pre preserving client confidentiality here. Um, the, uh, th this organization uh, came to me and said, you know, we haven't heard from our tech team in about nine months. And we're getting a little bit worried. I said, yeah, <laughs> should we get worried after nine days, after like nine minutes, there, there's something wrong here. And they said, yeah, we just don't seem to see much from them. They keep showing us graphs of all the great stuff that they're doing. And um, it, 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 nothing act ever uh, actually seems to work. That, that, uh, what, what should we do about that? And so I said, well, let me meet them and, and find out what's going on. And it turned out that um, I think everybody here was trying to do the right thing. There wasn't anybody who had a, um, a, a negative purpose. Uh, but as it turned out, um, uh, nothing literally worked. And that was why they couldn't show anything that worked, because nothing worked. And so they had had a, a, a team over here at, at one location, and another team over here, and another one over there, and another one over there. Each one kind of had something that vaguely kind of did its own thing, but none of them connected to anything else. And they were trying to replace an existing system. This was just not working. And, and so this was an example of very, very poor governance of these different organizations. And I came back and said, you know, you've wasted the last nine months. There's really nothing here. There's actually this one guy right here, and he knows how your current system works. So maybe we can do something with him. So what the founder did, I didn't tell him to do this, but this was the result, is uh, he said goodbye to all of those folks. He said, this just isn't working. Please uh, leave, leave my uh, contractual relationship. And we rebuilt the whole team around the one guy. And with the current system, he was able to actually produce what the company needed in a week or two rather than the nine months that the previous folks had taken. And then we rebuilt um, uh, and they're gradually replacing the system instead of trying to do it all at once with outside people. And they're doing it with inside people. So they're, they're doing it without contractors. So neither of those stories are very helpful unless I draw the, the, the distinction for you. So let me illustrate what was, was different in the two. Uh, I see great questions from Nico and Brandon as well. So glad to see you guys coming in, uh, going to get to your questions. Um, so uh, for, for Struan's question, what, what's different here? So the, the chief thing that happened was that there was um, frequent and effective communication with the outside uh, team. So um, uh, uh, and, and effective is the crucial thing because um, there were a lot of graphs going back and forth um, showing how the, the the one team that was unsuccessful was making tremendous progress and this part's done and this part's ready and this part's doing this bit and here's a video of these guys. None of it had ever worked together to actually solve a problem for a real customer of that company. And that's where you really get into trouble is, is where you uh, where you don't have um, that kind of, um, uh, of information uh, flowing, namely real working code. 
So um, you want to see actual results, ideally released to real customers, at the very least um, actually demonstrable and visual visible to you. Um, and the way I like to say this is it's crucial really in any organization, but it's extra crucial when people are far away and, and not working directly for you. It's crucial that people be accountable to you. I don't like the term being held accountable. I don't say I'm going to hold Lukash accountable because it feels like I'm going to point my finger at Lukash and say, do this now. Um, and Lukash doesn't often respond well to that. I know him. So, but if I say, Lukash, I'd like you to give me an account. I'd like you to tell me, you know, you're in Los Angeles. I'm here in England. Uh, you know, what, what's happening in your team? Lukash, I'm sure, could tell me. He could show me, which would be even more valuable, and that would give me a lot of information. If I'm doing that every day, as that one successful company was doing, really, really vigorous communication, frequent um, uh, uh, demonstrations, understanding of what the, the team was doing, uh, that, that's going to be much, much more successful. Uh, so I think that's the major difference that makes that um, successful. And then, of course, the unsuccessful one was the one where nobody ever demoed anything. No one had any idea whether any of the bits were working. There was a lot of communication, but it wasn't effective. Um, so follow-up questions, I suspect. Um, uh, there's lots more to say about that, but I hope that was helpful. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, we have Nico with a comment, I think. Um, I'm not reading these ahead of time, by the way. So, um, you know, say nice stuff. <laughs> I hope, hope it's all good. Um, but I know Nico. I'm sure he's saying good things. I think the main difference is whether they work for you as a normal team member or if you delegate the direct management to someone else in an outsourced company. Now, that's very interesting, Nico, because that, that is right that that's a common failure mode, but it's not actually... Um, I have seen it work where you do delegate the, the management, but you have to delegate it carefully. Um, so uh, there's one way of building where you delegate everything to do with software to the other people. You just say, fine, you're doing the product management, the project management. Um, you're defining the requirements, whatever that means. You're uh, doing the testing. I'm just going to magically get perfect working software. That doesn't work very well. Um, and out, certain types of outsourcing companies will try to sell that to you. Please don't buy it. Um, or if you do, plan to hire me soon after because there, there are going to be some problems. But um, the situation I was describing, the one with Ukraine and Russia that was uh, that was successful, um, that those managers are local. Um, in fact, they figured out a way that they could um, sort of pseudo hire them, that there's actually a, um, a Ukraine and Russian company, I think. So there's some greater control and that the managers of those teams are, are, are being accountable to the folks in, in London and vice versa. People in London uh, who do a lot of the product management um, provide a lot of feedback and, and um, messages to the people in, in Ukraine and Russia. So um, if you delegate the direct management, um, but keep a, 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 a um, vigorous line of communication of um, accountability, most importantly, um, then you can actually be okay. What Nico's referring to, I think, is the, the negative situation where you say, great, I'm going to wash my hands of this. It's all for you. Uh, you tell me when my wonderful new uh, app is ready. That, that tends to lead to disaster. Uh, if Nico disagrees with me, he's, and he's very welcome to, um, or if anybody else has a different view, I'd like to hear that. Uh, News Now says, good distinction, definitely the former is what we're considering, where um, the people are normal team members. And, and that is more likely to be successful. I certainly agree. That's going to be a, a simpler situation. That's going to be less uh, painful to do. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, what other question? We have one from Brandon. Excellent. Hi, Brandon. Checking in from uh, Nova Scotia, I think, or, or Labrador. I can't remember. Someplace cold and Canadian. Um, uh, I'm a fan of Squirrel's what and how t-shirt approach to product. Fantastic. I can explain what that is for people who don't know. Adoption can be difficult, especially when the shirts shift from CPO, CTO to product software leads. Any advice for adoption? Fantastic. So I bet, first, I better explain the what and how. Lucas, did I do the what and how with you? I can't remember if we did it. Mm, I don't remember. It's been Well, I'll remind years. you and remind yeah. plenty, plenty of other folks who, who probably don't know. So um, uh, one time I had to explain what the product managers did and the um, en engineering lead, uh, team did uh, to a group uh, in a company of about 100. And lots of them had not encountered this distinction. They just thought, oh, those tech people over there do some stuff. And then I needed to explain it. So I had my designer who, who made uh, all the art on DouglasSquirrel.com. I have no artistic ability. So I said, can you make some shirts with the logo of the company? And she said, great, what do you want on them? And I said, well, I want one of the shirts to say what across the front. She's like, great, that's good. And then I wanted to say dead on the back. She said, what? That seems very strange. I said, no, hang on, we'll, we'll finish. And then I want the other one to say how. And then on the back, I want it to say lines. And she said, well, I understand the front, but the back is really weird. I said, just make the shirts. So she shipped the third shirts. We got them the right size. And we handed out the um, what shirts to the um, uh, product people. And we handed out the how shirts to the, excuse me, engineering people. 
And um, the uh, uh, engineers and, the, uh, and one representative each stood up at the company meeting and said, uh, hey, we'd like to introduce ourselves and what we do using these shirts. So I'm the product manager and I decide what we do. And uh, I'm, I'm the other person said, I'm the engineering manager and I decide how we do what she said uh, we should do. And then they both turned around. And they said, we are both responsible for deadlines. That was the meaning of the back of the shirt. So um, uh, I uh, did this with, with Brandon, described um, how, how he might divide um, these um, uh, responsibilities among his team and use this method to explain it. Brandon, I don't think you ever ordered your shirts because I often make them for, um, for my clients. So if you want shirts, you should get in touch with me. I'm happy to, to make some for you. Uh, at any rate, um, maybe I should sell them on my website. I think I do, actually. Anyway, um, so uh, Brandon says, uh, well, look, um, whether or not I have actual shirts, uh, how, how do I um, help people to move from sort of a small group that's CPO and the CTO to the individuals. How do I help them keep track of what their um, what their responsibilities are? So um, there, there's a kind of a trivial answer and a, and a more meaningful answer. The trivial answer is tell them. So you might get them shirts and um, you might describe to them that this is uh, what where your responsibility is and this is where your responsibility is. That's kind of the basics. And you, you know that you wouldn't, I don't think you're asking, how do I tell them? You, know, you open your mouth and you speak in English and they hear you. That's not the, the crucial thing. Um, but any kind of cultural change like this, anything where you want the um, uh, the the uh, um, the group that you're working with to adopt a new norm, which is what you're describing here, you want them to have a certain type of behavior where, oh, this is a what question. It should go to the person with a what shirt. Oh, yeah, that's uh, the product manager over there. Um, uh, and that needs reinforcement. And it needs reinforcement positively and reinforcement negatively. So uh, the thing you, you're doing is not only communicating what the expectation is, but communicating where people have ad adhered to it and where they haven't. Uh, and this is debt bound to like, basic operant conditioning. You can go back and read B.F. Skinner if you want. You want to reward good behavior and, and punish in a friendly way. We don't have to give them electric shocks, um, negative behavior where they're not doing what you want. So um, uh, what I'd be looking for is cases where somebody uh, either takes a what question to the product manager or um, engages the how uh, person with uh, the, the software lead with um, an architectural question. And you praise that and you praise it publicly. You want to make sure everyone is hearing it. This is the great behavior. This is what we want to do. I'm really pleased that so-and-so took a what question to this person and then she answered it in a helpful way. But then, of course, we see the opposite where you say, hey, wait a minute, we've got product managers over here answering uh, architectural questions and deciding which version of Kubernetes we should be running. Something is wrong here, everybody. We're going to stop. And you do this again publicly. Uh, th this is something that we're not going to continue. And you notice how I, I was um, negative about it without necessarily blaming the people, unless there's actual people to blame, which might be a different situation. But typically, what you want to do is single out people and say, this is the behavior we want, and uh, describe the team not doing what you want and say, well, we want to extinguish that behavior. Um, and the last thing to say about it, um, and when I mentioned extinguishing behavior, that's um, one where dolphin training becomes a very helpful thing to know about. If you want a dolphin to, um, say, catch a, a fish in midair, you know, they jump out of the water and catch a fish or something like that. Um, and, and then what you want to do is uh, praise and reward the behavior that is positive and only mildly um, rebuke or, or ignore the behavior that you don't want. So um, you definitely want whatever, uh, and, and that it leads to what the trainers call extinguishing behavior. So the, the, the behavior where they ignore the fish or where they knock the fish into the next pond or something like that. You, you, you want not to reward that behavior either with negative attention that's over uh, too much or positive attention. You want to make sure that where the attention goes is to the positive behavior. So you want much more to catch people doing the right thing than to punish them for doing the wrong thing. Uh, people aren't dolphins, so you can do a little more of the, the negative with them, but you definitely want a lot more positive. Uh, Brandon, I hope that helped with your question. I'm very happy if, to, to see more about add... it. And Lucas, yeah, Lucas has yeah, more code. I found I found one thing that that is quite interesting uh, in terms of people's behavior is that the software leads that I've seen the most effective on that uh, product engineering spectrum are people who are the most customer obsessed. However weird that sounds. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just knocked my water <laughs> on the floor. Go ahead. Uh, um, and I found that people who who on the engineering side can kind of wear the product hat even if, if they don't have to are probably the most effective at like managing oh, engineering teams. 
because oh, of absolutely they, you want they them to be, be able to do both we're back to mm -hmm, your t-shaped exactly. people again even if this that's not their primary responsibility but then the conversations between the product side of things and and the engineering gets so much more productive because they they just focus again on what matters rather than well we cannot ship it because our i don't know xml processor is slow or whatever the case may be um but i also found the reverse uh is very very detrimental it's something that i had to well, you mean, I was so, part you mean of... somebody who can't who can't function, who can't understand a, a how because, person who doesn't understand the what. Yep. Because the sandbagging of of just engineering against everybody else just just grows exponentially. And and I've seen organizations where this just just stops. Nothing nothing ever gets done because there's always like some firefighting or technical debt or whatever that may be. And there's always a good excuse not to do something. And 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 a good engineering leader, even within a single team, should be able to to squash that quite effectively if they have just a bit of that product mindset. It can be trained. It's a skill like anything else. There's nothing special about it. OK. All right. So uh, we have, I think, exhausted all the questions. Um, yep. So that's all the questions I see that are available for the moment. Uh, so Lukash, uh, I'll ask you for, for one more. We're coming toward the end here. We'll, we'll finish up reasonably soon. So get your questions in. If you have another one, fire it my way. Um, you haven't asked any really hard ones yet. So um, <laughs> give, give, me oh. a, give me a really tough one if you've got one, Lukash, and, and everybody else um, pick up your hardest that, one. Yeah, the tough questions that, that we had happened like three or four years ago, whatever, we had the sessions. Um, That's true. I, I, I'm a huge proponent and a fan of, of distributed work and, and, and remote work. That's that's basically was one of the reasons why I founded my own company. I just couldn't find uh, a remote company. Yeah, and, was... and you ran everything remote, right? It was remote yes. first. You didn't have an office. You had everybody in distant locations. For yeah, sure, for short periods of time, we had like a small office, but it was always majority of the people were outside of it. And sure. whenever it was possible, we had uh somebody flying over just because they happened to be in london back when we used to live in london but it just so happened uh two or three years ago as me and my co-founder moved to los angeles one of our engineers moved to japan and we went from being on one continent to being on three and multiple time zones and what i'm finding quite quite hard uh to deal with is is even more than before kind of accepting this 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 setup of we have a central office where majority of people are or they are in the same time zone and then you have satellite people not even offices where they are completely kind of disconnected and, and uh it's a hard problem for, from my perspective because my solution is like you just have everybody distributed <laughs> don't have offices because that removes the huge imbalance of in terms of communication but mm -hmm. sometimes it's just not feasible it's 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 for one reason or another, have you seen any successful tactics for like how to mitigate that? Because it and, is something that that will what happen. It, what exactly am I mitigating? I got a little bit lost. So, so uh, I'm mitigating the, the, this um, the, kind the of satellite imbalance. office exactly. problem. Yeah. yeah, the imbalance of like people being in centralized office or even centralized time zone versus yep. everybody else. Well, I'll tell you my favorite solution to this one, which I've not actually seen anyone implement right in front of my nose. I've just told people about it, and they said, that's a good idea, and they maybe do a little of it, but I wish people would do more. This is what um, Stack Overflow, the people who make the Stack Overflow website for um, uh, developers um, getting their questions answered, um, uh, they, they do huge amounts of um, overseas work, and there are lots of people in lo remote locations. And if Lukash and I were not in um, uh, the UK and Los Angeles, um, but we were in the same office, then if we wanted to have a discussion like this, maybe with all of you, what we would not do is for Lukash and me to go into an office and then to call all of you and you'd all appear on the screen and Lukash and I are sitting there going, ha ha, yeah, you know, that, that, that uh, Nico guy, boy, he's got it wrong. Or, or yeah, that Struan guy, boy, you know, that there's not that special um, relationship. Instead, what would happen is Lukash and I would both go into booths and we would get on um, uh, a call like this and we would not be in a common office together. We would all be equal. And even if Lukash and I were in the same office wanting to have a discussion and we could physically go down the coffee shop or whatever, we wouldn't do that. We would go into the booths again and call each other from the same office in the same location. So it really puts everyone on the same um, footing. For example, you make sure everybody has good microphones, right? And good earphones. It's not that somebody has um, um, poor connection or something. It's like, man, all of us have to do this for every meeting. Um, now, it requires a huge amount of discipline to do that, right? And people have to uh, talk about norms, right? So uh, I was telling Brandon to uh, extinguish behavior. You're going to have to extinguish a lot of behavior uh, hmm. in order to, to get that 100%. to work um, and really impre impress it on people. We definitely um, did but, the first one. But the second okay. one is, is 
it does require like uh, some something has to switch in your brain to to do that because it is like this doesn't make any sense we're in the same physical space like why we would do that just for our own meeting and, and exactly yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, and i'll tell you a secret about lucas i hope you don't mind if i if i um tell tell the secret that i'm about to um about you and your co-founder lucas is um uh, uh, in a relationship with his co-founder so um uh, she and he live in the same place so um they're in the same location in the same apartment uh, or whatever in the same flat and um, if you were following the Stack Overflow model, you would go into say, you know, one would go in the bedroom, one in the kitchen, and you'd pretty phone much. each other. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty that, was much what, what that would be what you would have to do. But <laughs> do if that. you applied that discipline, then I think you would you would be mm -hmm. making a very powerful statement to the rest of the organization. This is important. We care about remote work. We want to do it right. And that yeah. goes back to something I, I think I left out for Brandon, which is Brandon should be a model. Right. So um, when he's trying to establish his norm, it would be really uh, effective if he said, um, you know, I I've not quite done it right. I went to the how person when I should have gone to the what. This is a case where it's actually good to do the negative side for yourself. And, and I haven't done it quite right. I was talking to a another client this morning and um, uh, the question was, how do I get my team to do demos more? How do I get them to show what they're doing and not try to polish it and make it perfect? And I said, you demo your work. This person's still writing code. So I said, you demo yours when it's not finished and it's wrong. And you say, I'm stuck here. Can anybody help me? Let, let me show you. And it's powerful when he in a leadership position takes the action. So similarly, Lucas and his, uh, his co-founder could do that. Indeed, we were on our retrospective this morning, and Sophia dialed in from her office. I dialed in mine from mine. Well, office. okay, so there you go. It. So you're applying it. Good for well, you. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. It's just that that this notion of like, if we have to have a meeting uh, together, like that would be very, very really hard sell. That would be hard. Like, I can't argue. Yeah, yep. Exactly. But but the benefits are high. So yeah, there's absolutely. a good challenging absolutely. one. Okay, good. That was a nice hard question. Excellent. Nico says, uh, do you have advice on how to run due diligence before acquiring another company? Checklist methodology, hard-earned lessons. Well, the first thing you can do is, er, is hire me because I do this kind of due diligence, but I'm only kidding. Um, I, I'm really not trying to sell you on it. Um, so uh, I don't have checklists. Um, I do have my process that I follow, um, but it, it, I, I will confess it's not rocket science what you cover. Um, the, the list is, is not... Um, uh, difficult to create or difficult to find. Um, I'd say the methodology that's most important is to get as much information as you can from as many different perspectives as you can. So for example, when I do due, due diligence, I don't own technical due diligence. I don't only check um, with the technology team and I get quite a good picture of, of what they're doing, but also um, I, um, uh, I make sure to talk to at least several people, um, a, a senior leader like a CEO or a chairman of the board, um, and somebody in marketing or sales or someone's kind of internal customer. Um, and, and that gives me quite a different perspective and often corrects or colors um, what I see for the rest of the organization. One example I remember um, from some time ago, uh, I, had a, uh, I had a kind of inkling that there was something that the tech team wasn't really telling me, that there was something that wasn't really working. And, and the head of sales said, oh, yeah, the CTO just um, uh, tells us a rosy picture of what's happening. And, and then what's actually happening is very different. Uh, and, and so we all know that and we discount what he says. Uh, and that was a very helpful perspective to get that I wasn't getting from the CTO or his team because from the inside, they had the rosy picture. What was happening on the outside didn't match. Uh, so I think that's the major one that uh, that uh, leaps to my mind, but feel free to ask, uh, ask me more about that. Um, we have what might wind up being our last question. Uh, this is great. Really, really good questions from everybody. Really appreciate it. Uh, hang around for a little bit uh, at the end about what's coming next and, and other things. Uh, but let's do this question. That is from NewsNow. Oh, I forgot to put Nico's question up. So, sorry, Nico. But uh, here's one from uh, my friends at NewsNow, uh, I suspect from Struan. Um, grads and juniors are at a real disadvantage joining re fully remote teams, being unlikely to have the needed soft skills. How can onboarding be reimagined to make hiring fully remote grads, juniors work? Well, that's a good uh, puzzle. Um, I haven't seen great examples of this, I have to confess. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anybody in fully remote teams who hired um, completely inexperienced people. Very, very difficult. Um, and and um, not only for the soft skills, but also for, for um, the, the coding practices of the team, the, the methods that they use, and so on. Um, so uh, very, very challenging. Um, I'd say the same kinds of things that I always used um, when I was hiring grads and juniors um, would be very helpful. And that is heavy duty pairing. 
really, really tight um, uh, interaction with a, a wide variety of different people, but, but very intense um, sharing of the screen, um, uh, writing code together, asking lots of questions, um, getting uh, um, re really good feedback for that person. Now, it used to be that was almost impossible remotely. They're actually very, very good tools these days. Um, and I have teams teams that I've worked with where pairing is a, a, a standard practice. Um, they have all the right tools. You can really interact and you know look at how we're interacting here, right? So yeah, uh, although you guys aren't on the screen, you can imagine uh, you know, me and Nukish pairing. Uh, we have high fidelity vis visibility of each other. We can share um, items on the screen. We can type together. We can do a lot um, that you couldn't do previously. So um, uh, my prescription here would be uh, allow more time. This is never going to be as efficient as having people be in uh, the same office. But um, give them not only a buddy who's going to help them with their questions, but a buddy who is actually writing code with them. And you can expect, as I did when I did it interactively in, in, in the office, um, a significant dip, right? So productivity is going to go down first um, because you've, you've got an experienced person who's spending a lot of time training and an inexperienced person who's taking up time with questions. That's a good thing because productivity will go back up to a higher level um, after you're finished, but expect a dip. And, and even with um, very, very clever grads, we had the, the kind of cream of the crop from Cambridge um, and Imperial who would come to us. We're very proud of our recruitment program. Um, we still expected uh, six months of dip before we got productivity. And um, uh, you know, the kind of record was three months. And um, uh, we certainly, um, uh, that that was in person, and I would expect longer if you have to do it remotely. I think doing it remotely is good. We should develop those tools, and we should get better at them. Um, but you are on um, kind of new ground there. So excellent, very hard question. I like that one. Uh, I'm going to reflect more on that one because I, I think there's probably more I'm leaving out. Okay, um, so I'm going to br bring us to a close there. Uh, I hope those were helpful questions. You guys all know me, so, or many of you know me, I hope. So uh, you know where to find me, DouglasSquirrel.com. Um, Follow-up questions would be welcome. I I'd love to hear from you guys. You're all members of something called Squirrel Squadron. You might not know this, but um, you're in my community. Um, and my community is going to start with these regular weekly events. So they're going to be, um, uh, for the next, next few weeks anyway, going to be at this time uh, when we started here. So 4.30 UK time on Thursdays. Might move them around depending on what feedback I get and, and how many people are interested. Um, but uh, next week, for example, we have one for the executive uh, group. And that's people who are uh, C-level heads of and so on. Uh, and we're going to be discussing... Um, uh, um, uh, how, what a CTO does, how to do job descriptions, whether you should do job descriptions. Um, that's with a brilliant recruiter named uh, uh, James Goodrich, who I've worked with on many CTO hiring uh, roles. Um, that's free. All of these are free. They're free for the my community. This is my way of giving back. Um, and then in two weeks, uh, pub uh, publicly available is a discussion about what the heck is Web3. So uh, I hope I find out because that's going to be fun. Um, but my goal is to uh, uh, help you understand, help you discover what this uh, crazy Web3 idea is. Do we need the blockchain on the web? It, it, are we going to have distributed identity? All of those kinds of questions. So um, please come along to that. If you'd like to, you can find all of this at. Now, if I'm smart, I should be able to type it in the chat, right? So let's see if I can do it. Squirrelsquadron.com um stroke events and i haven't got all these things hooked up very nicely so if you go to squirrel squadron.com you might not find um uh that there's a link to events yet my web person is is working on that but if you go to this website or if you have trouble finding it just ask me uh, that's where the upcoming events are um and i'd love to to see you with those uh all of them free all of them uh, uh available to you guys uh, to, to come along and learn from uh, and the other important thing is that there's going to be more coming in the community. Um, once we're able to get together, I'm going to hold live events, um, uh, chiefly in England first, but then uh, we'll be visiting various exciting places uh, in the next year. So hope to have live events. Um, and then also there's going to be a forum where we can have offline uh, interaction and, and questions. So uh, what I want to do is make sure that there's a great community of all of you. Uh, and all uh, colleagues, people that you would never meet otherwise. And we're all talking about how to um, cross that tech and non-tech divide and help um, uh, uh, technology teams become insanely profitable. That's my mission. Uh, thank you, Lukash, for joining us. Thank you to all of you for, for being with us. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, this will be available, by the way, as a recording, so you can come back and um, uh, look at this if, if you're interested. I'll send that out uh, in a few minutes uh, later today, later this evening. And um, uh, I look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.